I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Zias Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Welcome everyone to How to Play Spirit Island. We're going to teach you how to play a fun, cooperative, or even solo game that Linda and I really like to play together for a variety of reasons, uh, which we'll explain during the course of the game. So um, you can only see us when we have the camera like this, but we're about to adjust it so you can see the board. So hi uh, mm -hmm. at the beginning, and let's adjust the camera so that we can see the board. Yep. Let's see. Should just be able to tip it forward like that. Did that work? All right. Um, Yay! I think mostly this may want to slide a little, a little bit, bit over. over. Okay. okay. So now you can actually see us play. Um, Spirit Island is. And you can see our a, faces when we. Hunch yeah, when we like hunch that. over. Spirit okay. Island is a cooperative settler destruction game. If you've ever played games like Settlers of Catan, where you're always like. Bringing in settlers and uh, and building up all of your giant fog uh, uh, smog spewing cities and got stealing all the natural resources. This is the game where you are killing the people who are doing that. Mm -hmm. So you are the spirits, and you will drive off those evil settlers. That's right. So you're playing uh, the game. It's sort of has a backdrop of an alternate history age of exploration where there were more sort of superpowers during that age because of some slight changes to um, sort of European history so that they can create new adversaries for you to face in the harder difficulty modes. Um, and harder difficulty modes is one of the reasons that we really like this game is you can customize it to how good your group is and how veteran slash um, noobish or just how good you are at cooperative mm -hmm. games there's huge numbers of toggles such as uh adding in adversaries who are a different european country worth of settlers and then there's like six or seven or however many different Difficulty versions of every each single of those one of them. Yep. and they have a very clear backdrop of exactly uh how hard it is for each of those plus there's but there's ways to mess with the rules of the game in little scenarios, which also mm -hmm. change the difficulty, and you can combine them. It's pretty cool. And then if you want, you can even buy expansions for even more mayhem. That's true. <laughs> um, so. But today we're going to be demonstrating the uh, the a game that is set up in the way that they recommend you set up for your very first game. That's right. Um, there's four basic spirits, each of whom, uh, which is basic because it only has sort of one special power, but it's pretty strong power and then they have um their power cards that we'll get into later they're usually randomized mm -hmm. but for your starting game they are determined so what is your story for your spirit that you're going to be playing for us today? well i'd rather um start by explaining the game before we, uh, and explaining like what the spirits are so Fair enough. it's this age of exploration there are all these people coming to his settle and there's this island the island where the game takes place it is a mystical place that's full of spirits. It also has uh, the natives who live on there called the Dahan. Mm -hmm. And they and the spirits get along in particularly different ways. The settlers have been here for a little while, but eventually the spirits realize this is something new. This is bad. We have to act. So you're playing as spirits. And in general, um, you're going to be spreading your presence throughout the island, allowing you to use special magical powers that can help you scare away the settlers, kill the settlers, do other bad things to the settlers, protect the land. While the settlers, um, as you may be familiar with in other cooperative games, since everyone's on the same team, some kind of programmed element of the game is going to do something terrible. And that's going to be the settlers. So This um, deck which we'll be going into later. Yes. It's the deck of terrible things that happen. So they will, you will draw a card from there, and that causes them to send explorers out into certain regions of the map, then build um, their um, sort of towns, their smaller settlements there, or even cities if they already have uh, too many towns. And then um, later they ravage the area, pillage it for resources, and cause horrible... Uh, cause horrible sorts of blight and pollution. This is in the a area. settler. You can see there. You can see he's got a little flag and a conquistador helmet. Yep. 
And uh, and then they let's build see, the the towns. They build these little settlement towns. And these larger cities. So by the time that we decided to do anything about it, the there is a certain board state that's on the island. And the island is made up of one little mat like this um, for each player. And you can see uh, that it's got a sort of a desert called the sands. It's got a forest. It's got a wetland, which is the blue thing that my finger's on here. And then it's got mountains, which are the gray ones. Those are four different biomes. It matters which biome um, a different space is because of the fact that that's how you determine where the settlers go. They might go to the forest. Now, the back of the mats have a sort of... Here there be dragon style with spirits, more realistic island where there's deserts on one side of the mountain and it's wetter on the other side of the mountain. Mm -hmm. But that's, um, it not only has more spaces and it's harder and is not a big inner map, but it's also much harder because, well, if there's lots of deserts all in one place on the island, then when the explorers come to the desert, somebody's going to get inundated. So yeah. we're going to be playing with the basic map, but... Um, oh, the small pieces were way out of focus when I brought them near the camera. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks for letting us know. Um, I don't know if there's another great way to show them for, for that, but of course you can, um, I'm sure you can find many pictures of the game pieces themselves online, and we'll be talking about which pieces right. we're using. On so by the time that well. we have started um, with, like, realizing that there was a problem that we had to deal with, there are certain things on the island. How do we know what they are? The, uh, the mats actually show little iconography to tell us what is already on the island. So, for example, um, on my island, there is a city that is already built on the coast over here. You can sort of see it where, where I'm pointing to it with my finger. It's on this mountain space right by the coast. Um, there are some Dahan villages. Linda sort of has all of the yeah, Dahan over there, so I can't place them. Yeah, one of the things I really like about them. the Dahan, Dahan villages is that while the... Um, is that while this set, well, the settlers and all their associated pieces are made of white plastic, the Dahan villages are wooden pieces. That's right. So there's some Dahan villages on the rest of the coast on my board. Um, there's also um, a little bit of blight on the island to begin with. That could be because of the settlers, but more likely it's because having some blight, and here's the blight, it's sort of this Bubbly, plastic sludgy Sludgy stuff. gray plastic piece, yeah. Um, some blight is indicative of just, like, there's forest fires that are necessary for, uh, the replenishment of the land. So, uh, but there's not really a lot of the, um, the colonialists here. There's a lot of, there's a lot of Dahan, there's a little bit of blight, there's one city, and there's one settlement. Mm -hmm. Um. And that's sort of how each of the two mats start out. When we combine them together, we've got the island. For four player, you have four mats. For three player, you have three mats. So you might notice that each of us set up all the things on our little board. Um, instead of like having one person do all the Dahan and one person do all the other things. It's actually recommended in the game that each person handles the events on their particular board. Um, and their board just means the board that's near them. Yeah. It is absolutely... Very unlikely that only one person is ever going to be able to interact with their board because where you can interact with actually depends on a mechanic that we'll get into mm -hmm. later. But it does help for um, it does help for keeping track of things if you say, okay, everything that's on this board, you handle that. That way you don't have situations where you forget to have one of the bad things the settlers do happen or where two people have one of the bad things happen by accident. So we've set up the island. Mm -hmm. Up here, which you can sort of see is um, the tracker for everything else. Linda showed you that down here there are the cards that determine what the um, what our opponents are going to be doing mm -hmm. um, sort of randomly. Here you can actually not quite see. I'll slide that down a bit for now. Um, there's a fear deck. This is um, some random fear events that will happen based on us scaring the um, settlers uh, later in the game. Um, they can give us a variety of beneficial effects and eventually can scare them enough that we win. 
Um, and we which don't know what's in that deck later. because there are there are more fear cards in the game than you'll use, and they're also randomized, so we don't know what kind of benefits there. There are also more about. settler cards in the game than you'll use, but use almost all of them, so you have a pretty good idea of mm -hmm. what is in the deck. There's also ten blight that have been placed over here where I'm pointing that you might be able to barely see, probably not, um, are on this blight um, space. They are taken off this space whenever blight happens on the board, and if there's an all taken off, we lose the game. In yes. a more advanced game, there you usually have a blight card that has space for a lot fewer than ten blight, and then when that gets removed, it's flipped over, something bad happens, and then you get a little bit more blight before you lose the game. Sort mm -hmm. of an intermediate state of, hey, you're, you're kind of losing. The island is blighted now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but not for the beginner game, which is Not in the beginner today. game. And then we have eight fear that's four for player that's at the top. You won't be able to see it, but they're these little sort of purple... Tokens with, tokens with skull things on them. With like these special little skull things on it. And you use that to determine when you get a fear card. Four for player, when you've generated all of them by moving them from the top to the bottom of the fear area that's here... Um, then you reset them back to the top and get another fear card. So that's mm -hmm. the setup of the game. It, do, it's not, it doesn't take too long to set up, except we haven't set up our players yet. Um, but that's how we set up the opponents. That's how we set up everything. What, what are we going to do? So uh, we are these spirits. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, um, that I like about the game, and I think you like about the game too, is that each of the characters has a strong personality and mechanics that reflect the personality of that spirit that make yeah. you feel like... Well, I get so excited you're... about their stories, too. Like, yeah, let's I know. Tell Linda wanted to tell their stories before we even indicated like what the game was because yeah, she but loves well, their stories. I love their stories. I know, also, awesome. we were talking about the lore of the game. So That's that true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, like, the ocean, which is a more advanced one that we're not playing... It's super powerful, but it's like literally only the ocean. And if you if anything gets inland into any mm -hmm. of these spaces, forget it. So And that actually uses this little ocean section on the board that we didn't talk about as a space. But unless you've got the ocean spirit, you really just don't. That's worry right. About that one. So today we're playing two of the beginner spirits. Um, the ones we're not playing, there's a shadow who's kind of good at fear and attacking, and there's a lightning bird that sort of charges up energy on one turn and does pretty poorly to do something ridiculous the next turn. It's not exactly how you have to play it, but it turns out to work well because it can do a lot of things, but it doesn't get a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones we're playing are called Vital Strength of the Earth is mine. It's this giant earth guy. Here we go. Mm-hmm. Um, and then and then I'm playing River Surges in Sunlight, which is just one of right. my favorites overall. I like the spirit. The spirit is uh, the spirit is good at moving things around on the board. That's right. And each of them has a story, and each of them have abilities that really reflect what that spirit stands for. So, Vital Strength of the Earth is a spirit of great and unhurried power. The life that earth yields up to roots, the ground supporting the life that lives upon it, the patience of seasons and stone. It is not usually a direct benefactor of the Dahan, rather than giving them blessings that prefers to work in concert with them, lending power to joint undertaking. Currently, it is trying to rouse itself to fight against the invaders, but this swift and direct action runs somewhat counter to its nature. And vital strength has so much energy, but can play cards only slowly and methodically and... Um, it has a mechanic that deceptively looks really powerful, but can sort of, uh, cause you to, um, really, really play into the role, which is that, um, later we're going to explain that there's a special thing you do where you can potentially get stronger by putting your presence on the map. Um, most characters, um, th there's also a mechanic where you redraw your discarded cards. Mm -hmm. Most characters, the turn that they redraw is a bad turn because they're not going to be getting stronger with their presence. They might get something cool. Earth is set in its ways, so Earth can actually grow very strong. One of its best presence plays is while just redrawing its discarded cards. Mm -hmm. So it likes to do the same things over and over, but Earth has a lot of trouble getting anything new. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Whereas most, most of the spirits, it's no problem getting new powers. But Earth Earth 
uh, Earth's worst presence play is the one that it does well. Presents are, are these little colored round tokens. They basically, um, of all the powers that you have yeah. will have some sort of a thing that uh, talks about what range you can play them at from your presence. So your presence determines where on the map you can. Do That's stuff. right. Um, your presence is also used um, to sort of block off your character progression. While it's still on your mat, you don't have the character progression that's covered up by it. And then when you remove the presence, you gain the ability. So, for instance, um, on Linda's sheet, which is pretty far away, so you probably can't read it. Yeah, but if it gets too Even close. Even if it gets too close, you probably can't read it either. But I you can that see that there's be... some tracks. Yeah. And that it'll all be covered up from... You remove them from left to right, gaining the values that are mm -hmm. on the track. So we'll be covering up all of these, uh, all of these other ones, except for the one that's on the far left to start with. And as we un as we reveal them, then we'll we'll gain more powers. That's we don't right. cover them up just yet because we need to figure out something that's on the back. And I also need to read my story. That's right, but I'll do the thing that's on the back. So it says, put three presents on your starting board. Two in the mountain with the highest number. They all also have numbers in addition to the icons. That's over here. And one in the jungle with the highest number. So I start like deep, deep into the inland of the island, away from the shores where the, where the settlers are coming. Um, and that is where my presence is. And I put one on my starting board in the highest numbered wetlands. Um, so uh, the, the highest numbered one of these blue spaces, the one has two, one has five, I put it in the five. And just the one? Yep. Yep. River only starts with one. That makes sense. But river can place river can place two at a time with one of their basic things that they and do. Based on our explanation that presence determines where you can do your powers, you might be wondering why why did I place two in the same place if you only need to be one away. If two in the same place makes it a place of power for you, it makes it a very special area that um, certain cards say have to be cast within a certain distance of a place of power or else or a they sacred don't... site is oh, sorry, sacred site that's mm -hmm. what it is a sacred site certain cards have to be cast within a distance from a sacred site instead of just within a distance of any um presence and um my character has a special ability um which is that every land that has my sacred site automatically gains defend three against um ravaging my character's special power is that anytime I have one presence in a wetlands, it's automatically a sacred site, even though it's not. So sacred. Linda has a sacred site there with her one presence <laughs> that's on a wetlands, because so, that's just how it goes. Uh, I'm going to read my story now. All right. <laughs> river surges in sunlight. On most of Spirit Island, the rivers run high during the rainy season, as one would expect. There is one exception. The lingering remains of an ancient curse keep a high ridge shrouded in ice. And when the sun beats down, it feeds a single river with abundant meltwater. River surges in sunlight is a spirit of rushing water, inundation, and bounty out of season. It gets along well with the Jahan who farm along its banks. They reap the benefits of good harvest and tend to the health of the river in its drier times. Both gain. All right. So river is really good at pushing things around into different areas. Killing things? Not so much. <laughs> River's okay at killing things. Not great. Um, although, if you have the ocean, River can push things into the ocean and drown them, and it's a good combination. I like playing like River you while expect. you play ocean, and then I just feed you things, and then you get stronger, and they're dead. It's delicious. <laughs> um, so, basically, at this point, we have completed setup for the game. So, another thing you'll, you'll notice about this game is there's a lot of things going on. It's not overly complicated to do your own thing but one of the benefits of the game actually is the fact that what an individual spirit can do is very different from what another spirit can do and in once you've gone past the tutorial game the randomized powers means it's almost impossible to predict uh, and remember exactly what the other person can do this is good because of the fact another reason why we really like this game is and a lot of cooperative games have something that's sometimes called like the alpha player problem or the pandemic problem because pandemic is a really good game that has this problem mm -hmm. where if you have players who are good enough, which Linda and I and almost all the people we play with 
all are. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these cooperative games, players are pretty symmetrical, where it's like, you can do basically the same thing, and you all have, like, one little special power. Uh, Pandemic has that. A lot of the other ones have that. It's very easy for all the players to look at the, uh, the game state, figure out where the problems are, and then they know you can maybe... You may have forgotten the other person's special power in Pandemic, mm-hmm. but you probably didn't. And you know, okay, you're the only one who's close enough to that city. You should probably go there, and your power is, is developing a disease cure. So do that if you can. Mm-hmm. Um, in Spirit Island, if you have players who are very experienced, they can find the problem areas still and be like, okay, these are the four spaces that are going to be a problem for us during the game. And it looks like you're the only one who can take care of it. Mm-hmm. But at that point... It's all up to that player who knows their powers to decide how to take care of yeah. it. So they haven't really done anything except for help the player who's a new player sort of settle down on where they should be focused on the board. And then the new player still has tons of um, space to explore and figure things so out these on their cardboard, own. So these cardboard oh, people tokens are, saying things are uh, I know, I know, but they, I want to add to that okay. real quick. Uh, these cardboard tokens are really useful because they're pretty much the I'm doing something in this space token that you used to communicate to the other players. Um, Nificro says the developer did mention that at the end of each game, players are encouraged to look at their new suite of powers and decide on a new name for the spirit. Is it now a different spirit than when it began? I'd never heard of that before. That sounds really That makes cool. sense, though. Uh, and then and also um, said that it's not worth it to try it is possible uh, to alpha, to, to alpha. Player of the game, you yeah. can but you have to let's put it this way if you are a player who knows what you're doing in pandemic and you're playing with people who don't mm-hmm. you you almost have to stop yourself from um from alpha because the pandemic is also hard right mm-hmm. and like just giving the basics of we should go to this city you've already kind of given away yeah everything what the, what the strategy is yeah but as long as you just don't pay that much attention to what cards the other person is getting or even just don't have them tell you mm-hmm. uh, unless it's a cooperative card you you can almost you could pretty easily prevent yourself from even being able to alpha and spirit island by just not not knowing exactly what they can do and being like we should probably deal with this and then the other person's like well the most i can deal with is these ones and you say okay um and then let's and see. And it says the uh, the only time I think alpha gaming is okay when there is when there is exactly one way to solve the puzzle and your fellow players want to win. I've met people who care less about winning than they do participating. Yeah, that's fair enough. Mm-hmm. That's fair enough. The the thing about um, but if you, but the I thing about Spirit you... Island is you can tell what's happening. Mm-hmm. Whereas another thing, just to compare to Pandemic, because it's a game I really like that has totally has the alpha player problem, is that. In Pandemic, you never know if you're going to get um, a whole bunch of epidemics like in a row that just spread everything out and yeah. screw everything up for you. Um, so you're constantly afraid of the fact that it may actually have been unwinnable, like literally unwinnable for any combination. So there may be zero or one solution to Pandemic. Mm-hmm. In Spirit Island, that's also possible on the harder difficulty modes, but that's pretty much guaranteed not to be true on the easier difficulties. Yeah. But I think that I think that it does go back to the point that if you are someone who uh, has strong alpha player tendencies, this could be a good one for you to try out to like because because it's hard to alpha in that one. If you want, right. if you have that as an issue in a co-op game, um, Enrico says the first Spirit Island expansion has a lot of randomness volatility, making it easier to get out of the approach of trying to super plan on each turn, which also reduces the incentives to alpha. That's right. Yes, that's definitely true. We really, I really like the the expansion. Um, the uh, branch and plot expansion which we have which introduces like a lot of random events and other cool stuff that happens and that's right i'll shake it up in fact they it had been intended for the game to include the random events from the start to shake it up as another anti-alpha tool but it was just too much Mm -hmm. for new players so that um instead of having some events and then more in the expansion they relegated all of them to the expansion. oh yeah and jagged earth expansions coming out next month that's right and uh-huh. one of the things I like that the developers of this game did too is that they had sort of their their promotional spirits and things like that that they do for that they did for Kickstarters and things like that. But you can still later get those even if you weren't originally in on the in on the Kickstarting. So we have like some additional cool spirits from that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's something I think that the publishers greater than games always do because they did that with um, Sentinels of the Multiverse as well. 
Let's see. What Sick Island Multiverse is also really fun. And Miko says, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely overwhelming to try to play with all of those when you're just learning the basics. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, even if an experienced player is playing with, say, the Snake promo, which... Oh, he just mentioned Snack and Arsonist. Yeah, Snake promo. You don't want to play Snake promo with the new player. I did that by accident because we had just gotten it just before playing with the new players. And I was like, there's this Sneak. And it's super slow and it's completely a support character. And that sounds perfect for play styles I like and to play with new players. So let's do it. And then the snake wound up having a thing where um, one of the new players, who, who was Jason Keighley from Paizo, mm -hmm. um, ha had fed me a little bit of his presence. And so I just kept giving him power cards. And eventually he ran out of the predetermined stack of power cards that the game has th uh, thoughtfully set out for you. I was yes. cool forced to use the normal rules for normal random power cards on his first game. Yes. So, whoops. I mean, he was Jason Keighley. He could handle he it. He handled but, it, like, but lesson, I still don't lesson, recommend lesson teaching, learned. teaching people to play when you have a card that, a, 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 wait, with the snake, because the snake definitely messes with their stuff. All right. Oh, the snake was spread of rampant green. Yes, the, I call oh, it yes. the ear veggies. Yeah, no, we've Linda and I have done that. You've done that one. So it's actually fun. very strong. We've done it on a pretty hard difficulty on one. Yeah. Well, Rampant Green, I think, is actually my favorite spirit. You like one of the leshy ones? Yeah, well, it's not, it's just, I, I, I like that better than the one that's, like, actually a leshy, though. Yeah, the, the one that's Get Off My Lawn Leshy. Get Off My Lawn Leshy. But that's from the expansion, so. Yep. Squirrel. All right. <laughs> well, it's sort of on topic because we're is. talking about Spirit Island. But let's get into, uh, let's get into the gameplay. Mm -hmm. So we've set it all up. What's going to happen? So. Settlers are going to attack. Spoiler. You gave the whole... Oh, uh, that's it. We're done. No. <laughs> uh, so before we go, before we even go into any of the other turns, the settlers get a free first turn. That's Darn just... Settlers. That's just their deal. They get to do one thing because we're spirits. We're slow to react. We're just living on this island. And oh my gosh, they're going to the mountains. So they're exploring the mountains. They always do things in a certain order. Ravage, then build, then explore. Here's how Explore works. If there is a spot that is on the coast or that is next to a building, aka a town or a city, they will send an Explorer to that spot. So this one's next to a... This one's both next to the coast and next to a building. Well, the coast it wasn't safe anyway, but... And this one is... Um, and this one is next to a building. So I'm actually pretty happy it started well, the coast in... the coast is never safe. I'm That's pretty what I said. happy it started in the mountains because my sacred site is here mm -hmm. and it's protecting this mountain... So, yep. um, that's not bad at all. But this spot, these inner spots that I'm pointing to now, theoretically might not have gotten an explorer if they weren't next to a building. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this one forest building that's here... It's almost like the caused... designers of the game set it up so that every space on the board would be I would be next to a building. Yeah. To start with. They are next to a building. <laughs> or next to a coast. So um, they're next to the they're beef next to the settlements. So we got explorers on every spot. Mm -hmm. One, um, I guess one. It's strategy that's a little more advanced. It's harder to do for uh, beginners is to try to create areas where they won't get an explorer, so that they don't get to explore there. Which means later they won't build there, and later they won't ravage there. This is very important. Once we finish the explorer and the turn is done, in this case they got a bonus turn, so it's done. This explorer card that says mountain moves over onto the build spot. Next turn, they will build in mountains before mm -hmm. exploring in a new area. And in all future turns, they will ravage in, on turn three or turn two of the real turn. Yeah. They will ravage in mountains, then build in whatever the second card mm -hmm. is, then explore in the next one. It's deterministic. We know this for sure. That means that if we can prevent the exploration, we'll prevent a build. Mm -hmm. And if we prevent the build, the ravage isn't going to be as bad. So each stage of prevention that the earlier you do it just like for disasters in the real world when mm -hmm. disaster relief the earlier you handle it the easier it is to take care of it at that point in time so obviously we couldn't handle it now because they got a free turn before we could go but yes. now we're going to play a normal turn the normal turn um consists of basically um basically four main phases but there's also a lot of little things that could potentially happen there's the growth phase where spirits um, grow and become more powerful than they ever were before by um, choosing one of the options at the top of their spirit card. And uh, we could, when we do it, we'll read off what all of our options are. Mm -hmm. 
then um, we're going to select what powers we're going to play during the turn. Some powers are fast and some powers are slow. The fast powers happen before the, the settlers act on that turn and the slow powers happen after they act on that turn. Those are sort of the four main things that happen, but there's also, if you have a Blighted Island, which we won't have in this tutorial game, its power also happens um, during the invader phase, and fear cards happen during the invader phase, then the invaders take their actions. So, basically, uh, you have four phases, and then the, there is technically a fifth phase called Time Passes, which is when you sort of set up for the next round. Uh... So let's let's show you a turn. So on the spirit phase, we're going to be growing and then selecting our powers. So um, my growths, as I sort of alluded to earlier, I can either reclaim my discarded powers. Every time you play one, it gets discarded. You have to reclaim it if you want to play it again. I can reclaim all my discarded powers and add a presence anywhere up to two away from my current presence, which in the two-player game lets me add it almost anywhere except for the very edges of Linda's board. I can gain a new power and add a presence in a spot that already has my presence, mm -hmm. basically to create a sacred site. This is the only way that Vital Strike of the Earth can gain new powers. Vital Strike doesn't like learning new things um, that much. <laughs> and then I have a third option, which is I can add a presence up to one away, which is sort of the intermediate between those two in distances, and gain two bonus energy. I also automatically start with the ability to gain two energy per turn and one card play. But when, remember, as I said, when you remove your presence, you sort of upgrade your character. So if I remove my presence, there are two tracks on my card. When Linda showed it, you could sort of see an energy track and a card track. For Vital Strength, removing a presence from the energy track will always give him an energy, um, up, or give it an energy upgrade, two to three to four to six to seven to eight energy per turn for each presence removed. Uh, whereas card plays, uh, not so much. Yeah. One, then one. So no benefit if I do it on card plays at first. Then two, two, three, eventually four. Whereas, um, Whereas mine a lot are, different for yeah, my, mine, are, mine are different. Mine are, um, one of my choices is to reclaim my cards, gain one power, and get one energy. Um, another option is to add two presents in a little in a little river line, each of which is one away from one of the ones that I already had. And then in my last option is to, another option to gain a power, and uh, then add another presence that can be up to two away from... A little hop. A little hop. It rains more and the water goes down. Exactly. Yep, yep. Um, and then Linda's character, though, um, energy doesn't always go up by one every time mm -hmm. that she does it from energy, but she can immediately go from one power per turn to two per turn. And which, immediately from one energy per turn to two per turn. That's if right. I, if I get two She presents. starts with one instead of two. Yes. So... Um, this is important because the the presence that we take off the board during this first spirit phase actually influences that turn. So mm -hmm. if she takes it off of one card to two cards, she actually can play two cards on the very first turn. Now, could she afford it? Maybe not necessarily. So that, that can wind up being a problem. Um, and for vital strength, especially vital strength starting um, cards, because you each have uh, four starting powers uh, that are unique to that um, character as well as an innate ability and a special rule the special rule we already mentioned is that i defend for three in any land that's my sacred site that's this mountain mm -hmm. here linda just one counts as a sacred site on the wetlands that's her special rule um innate powers are a special power that you can play it doesn't cost you one of your power plays it doesn't cost any energy but it only happens when you play enough cards of exactly the right elements so every card, which is a power, has certain um, certain things on the card. Um, you can sort of see it. They're right along this side here is the elements. The elements are along the left side. At the very upper left is a number, which is the energy cost. Um, the, the elements, like this Rituals of Destruction, has five different elements, which is ridiculous. The elements, um, sort of you add up all the elements from the cards you're playing and see if you have enough for your innate power. Um, the cards also indicate, um, they have a little thing up here that indicates the speed. There's a turtle for slow or a falcon for fast. Guess what? Most of, actually some of my stuff is, is 
fast. Um, then there's the range. So Rituals of Destruction, the one I'm showing you here, has a picture of two presents and then one, uh, an arrow and one, meaning within one of a sacred site. And then it may have a target restriction. This one does. It can only target a land that has Dahan in it. Um, and then it has the card's ability. Rituals of Destruction says, deal two damage. If the target land has at least three Dahan in it, deal five damage and two fear. Mm -hmm. um, now, getting three Dahan, not always an easy task. But if you can, then Rituals of Destruction is very powerful. But it costs three energy, which is a lot in this game. And if you're wondering about keeping track of things, um, there are... There are these uh, sort of, um, they, there are also cards that come with the game that are little keys for the various icons. Um, so the, there's one card here that has, um, that has the a little key for, oh, this is what all these little icons mean and what, and what does it mean to, to target different areas and things like that. So I recommend using the, um, particularly for your first few games, these little handy key cards that describe um, this one describes the, what the little symbols mean. Um, the other side of this one, um, is a key to the little icons on your presence track and what actions you have each turn. Um, and then there's also, uh, there's also, um, another one that talks about, uh, what is the turn order on one side and on the other side, it talks about what are the different, what, what did, what are some of the different terms in the game mean? Like, what does it mean to push something? Right. Um, also, um, vital strengths and eight power gift of strength lets him uh, lets lets any spirit duplicate one of their powers of a certain cost. Mm -hmm. It's also almost impossible to get vital strengths um, and eight power to go off until pretty late in the game, unless mm -hmm. unless you happen to draw a new power for vital strength that has all three of the right elements, which the game has um, thoughtfully not provided in the uh, in the sample powers that I'm going to be gaining, and it's honestly very unlikely that you will get all of those. So mm -hmm. don't count on Vital Strength's innate power for you, whereas um, River has an innate power that may not be as strong as duplicating, but it can push and eventually deal damage, and, and the requirements are low enough that mm -hmm. Linda could possibly trigger the innate power on the very first turn if she goes to be able to play two cards. I'm not saying, like... It's game-changingly important that she does because mm -hmm. its its initial basic ability is just push one thing. Oh, I'm planning but, on it. Oh, she's planning on it. See, yep. whereas Vital Strength, I need so many elements that it's just... Oh, no, actually, it looks like I do have some cards. I could do it if I get to two card plays. So it's possible I'll be able to pull this off on turn two if I don't go for more energy. We'll see what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, so... That's um, everything that's on the cards that you can't quite see. We've described. Now let's um, go with the growth phase, and we'll talk about what we're doing. Okay. Um, I'm selecting the option that lets me add two presents because I really like to get two energy for turn and two card plays right off the bat. All right. That makes sense. So when I'm looking at the cards that I want to be able to play this turn... Or the cards that I want to be able to play this turn. I know that I want to be next to things that I want to mess with. I also like being in watery areas. But I also want to be able to eventually help out on your side of the map. So I'm currently kind of terrified by the fact that this mountain uh, mm -hmm. area, the one that is over here, is it's just, it's going to play itself. Yeah. Because this settler is going to build a settlement. Then they're going to ravage. My sacred site is going to protect it completely, and then the Dahan will destroy the settlement for me, and I don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. But over here, they already have a city, so they're going to build another settlement. It's going to be this, this really problematic area. Now, I have cards in my hand that by the time they ravage, which is soon, but not this turn, um, should be able to take care of it. The problem is I just need to make sure I have enough energy and that I have presence that's close enough to um to cause that to happen mm -hmm. so uh looking oh yeah looking at what our starting cards do that's one thing we didn't say yes. so i have a three cost slow power that i already told you about everybody that deals two damage in a land with the han near near sacred site or maybe five damage and two fear if the land has three to han 
I have a one cost slow card that can gather up to two settlers and Dahan into an area, which can be a nice way to either get the settlers not to build or you get them to build so a place with a lot of Dahan. So together is you target, you target one specific area and then you pull things into that area? Yep. It's called Draw of the Fruitful Earth. It can help me set up the one that needs three Dahan, the Ritual mm -hmm. of Destruction. I have Guard the Healing Land. That's a fast power within one of a sacred site that removes Blight, which puts it back on the island. Um, you're allowed to have more than the starting amount if I mm -hmm. remove the one that was starting there. And then it defends for four. Um, uh, basically, we'll get to this when we're in the Ravage, but each of these pieces deals a certain amount of damage when it's ravaging one for the settlers, two for the settlements, and three for the cities. Um, and as long as it deals one or less, the land is okay. Um, so defend for four is pretty good, but this area that I said I was wor worried about that has a city and a settler is going to be taking more damage than that. Mm -hmm. And that costs three, guard the healing land. And then a three cost fast card called a year of perfect stillness that is probably the one that I need to use um, two turns from now that says invaders skip all actions in target land this turn, and I probably need to make them skip they're ravaged that's going to be in this mountain. It's going to take me a little while to get over there and be able to help you. I'll take care of it. Um, for now, I will... Um, so, because of that, I don't want to reclaim cards that I haven't even played any of them, which mm -hmm. would allow me to instantly teleport over to this problem land. Um, but I don't really need to be in that land. All of my cards have a range distance of one. Which means that if I get myself into, for example, this forest over here, I can actually reach everything on my board with all of my current cards. Mm -hmm. um, my ability to get to the forest also would give me two energy, which could be nice if I want to play a three cause card. Um, but also, I could gain a power card and add a presence to this place, that this forest where I played one, and then that would be a sacred site as well. Uh, so, Linda, why don't you describe what you can do while I'm thinking about what I want Sounds to do. Sounds good. So, um, I have a few different cards that I can play. Um, one of them is a two-cost card, Flash Floods, that's very fast. And then I can use um, anywhere that's next to one of my presents. It deals one damage, and if the land that I'm hitting with it is coastal, it deals two damage instead. Um, I have another one, Wash Away. This is a slower power. Um, it costs one, and it is also next to, um, or w it, when I say next to, it's within one, so it can be in the same space as as well, um, within one of one of my presents, and it lets me push up to three of the little settlers or settlements. Um, can't push cities with that, but it's still pretty useful for shuffling things around out of the places you don't want them to be. Um, Boon of Vigor. Um, doesn't cost any energy and it's fast. You target any spirit. If you target yourself, you get one extra energy. If you target another spirit, they gain one energy per power card they played this turn, which with, uh, with vital strength is probably going to be one power card because that's kind of <laughs> how vital strength will, or, or two, you know, to be fair, eventually. Um, River's Bounty is, um, a slow one that you can only use in the spaces where your presence is. Um, you gather up to two Dahan, and if there are now at least two Dahan in that space, you add an additional Dahan, and you also get some energy. All right. That all sounds good. So, uh, Linda, I think I've um, sort of figured it out down to two possibilities. Mm -hmm. So th that'll depend on what you want me to do, because I could either create a sacred site here... Um, which would gain me Rouse the Trees and Stones as a, as a new power, which I would immediately play to do two damage to like one of these that we don't need to worry about right now yeah. in the slow phase, whichever one is bad. Mm -hmm. um, or I could do either that or possibly the one that gives me two energy and plays far away, it doesn't matter, to pull both of these settlers. Um, oh, no, it's slow. It doesn't matter. It's slow, yeah. Um, I was thinking I could stop them from building by pulling them into this into this jungle but th by the time i do that they will have already built so i'm planning to kill this one with a i'm planning to kill this one um or i can kill either this one or this one with the flash flood and um in the fast phase and then um by playing two cards um to get massive flooding here with my uh, with my innate power mm -hmm. to push the settlement 
from whichever one got a settlement off onto something else is safer. All right. So I am so I am going to do the rouse the tree and stone strategy. So I build a sacred site on this jungle. Mm -hmm. This gains me rouse the trees and stones because we're playing the um, the tutorial game where I automatically know what I get, and then I immediately play rouse the trees and stones as my power. That means it'll happen during the slow phase. That's going to do two damage. It's not one of the ones I read to you guys. It's going to do two damage and then push a settler. And if we happen to draw jungle or wetlands, guess which one I'm going to do two damage and push mm -hmm. the settler in the slow phase. So Linda did her little river making where she I made, made a, a little, river. Let's I see, a little is river something to happening ocean. in here? Someone asked if we are using power progression, which I assume means we're if we're using the... Uh, the stated the power stated progression. The stated power progression, like sort of the assumed yes. uh, default. Yes, we are. Which is, in my opinion, very, very bad for Vital Strength of the Earth because mm -hmm. I think that Vital Strength of the Earth should probably grab a major power quickly and go energy. Mm -hmm. um, but I, since I know what I'm getting and it's not a major power quickly, in fact, it's not even an expensive major power when I get one, um, I'm going to go card plays with Vital Strength this time. Mm -hmm. But if when you have it yourself and you're not using power progression, I highly recommend getting a really expensive major power for Vital Strength of the Earth and then going pres and going energy so that you can play it a lot. Um, and keep reclaiming it and playing mm -hmm. it every turn if you want <laughs> Um, so, um, I've created a sacred site. I'm going to play Rise of the Trees and Stones. And Linda, you've, um, created your little river and you're mm -hmm. going to be playing two cards. I'm going to play Flash River's Bounty and, River's and Flash Bounty. Floods. Okay. Um, so Flash Floods is a fast one. It is, in fact, the only fast thing that's happening, including Linda's innate power, which she triggered, mm -hmm. is Flash Floods. So that deals one damage Zap. instantly and kills that settler before he can build. Now, killing things sometimes gives fear, but only if you kill established settlements. They kind of expect that people who go out into the wilderness might sometimes never come back. and They never come back to tell the tale. Whereas when you kill a settlement, there's probably survivors who are like, oh my gosh, a flash flood came. This is scary stuff. Mm -hmm. So we didn't get any fear from that, but we prevented, Linda prevented a settlement from being built there. Um, slow old vital strength's not going to prevent anything though. So mm -hmm. now it's their turn, the turn of the enemies. So, what's going to happen? They're going to build on um, mountains. That means they build a settlement, or if there are more settlements than cities in that area, they build a city. Mm -hmm. no. And because I killed that guy before he acted, he doesn't, it's not That's there. That's right. So. Whereas I sort of, this is this one over here, like I said, is a dead settlement mm -hmm. walking. But this one over here now has a city, a settlement, and, a, and an explorer, which is pretty scary. Um, I'll, I, I mean... I know I figured out a way to handle it, but it's not great. Now let's flip over the next card. As long as it's not the desert card, then mm -hmm. my plan is good. It it's isn't. Not the desert. It's the, the wetland, wetland card. card. That means that they're going to explore onto every coastal wetland and every wetland that is next to a settlement, which is all of the wetlands. Yep. And then our slow phase occurs. So I have a couple of things that happen during the slow phase. Um, I have River's Bounty, which can let me gather Dahan into a place. Now, if you wind up having some way to protect this down the road, I can, I'm going to have a lot of Dahan there. So, I have an ability that near my sacred sites, if there are three Dahan, I can nuke it for five damage and two fear. Uh, but there's nowhere that we really want to nuke that's right near my sacred site. Mm -hmm. I mean, this one might seem like it, but I'm about to do Rise of Trees and Stones there. So, I will... I'm doing Rouse the Trees and Stones, like I told you guys. Two damage. Now, let's talk about damage. Remember how I said explorers deal one damage when they're ravaging, settlements deal two damage when they're ravaging, and cities deal three damage? That's also how many hit points they have. At the end of the turn, when time passes, they get all their hit points back. So mm -hmm. you have to do the damage now. Um, fortunately, two damage is exactly enough to kill this settlement that already started on this wetland. So I do. That creates one fear. The fear is one for killing a settlement, two for killing a city, zero for an explorer. It's one fewer than their number of hit points. Yeah. Although it doesn't go up if their hit points change. So normally when you're playing this game, you would take your turn simultaneously with each other, but I'm waiting to do mine so that I can kind of explain what I'm doing yes. as well. We can, you're allowed to just do everything at the same time unless you have to stop because people are doing something where order matters. I also get to push one settler. I am going to push the settler into my sacred site on purpose because mm -hmm. my sacred site has higher defense. So even if we get a jungle later, I don't care. So I'm generally going to be making this spot terrible and other spots not matter so much. Um, 
So uh, this guy with, with the with more Dahan in it. So River's Bounty gathers up to two Dahan. Oh look, there are now at least two Dahan. Add one additional Dahan okay. and gain an energy. Hey, nice. And then my um, oh right, I forgot. My but innate power also triggers. I forgot to give myself two energy from my income and then spend one energy for Rise of the Trees. And, and I can pick any spot that's within one one of a sacred site, which this definitely is. And then I can push uh, one settler slash settlement. That's true. So if you push the settlement into the de into the desert. Mm -hmm. Um, then at least at the moment, it's not a problem. The ravage is fine. So that's why I was asking if you have some way to nuke this spot, because if you can nuke this spot, I can push this in here, and then we can just I totally mean, nuke it. I have a thing that would deal five damage, but, but I would need to have enough. a sacred site that was within one of there, which is you're not really. Uh, that's be a able big ask from Vital Strength. He's not. Yes. It's not the fastest. So because uh, I checked, spirits. he's not going to be able to nuke that All right, spot. What do we have here? How is order determined if it matters is a good question. Uh, we just decide. We pick. We, it's, it's always um, based on our own mm -hmm. preference. And the the enemies have been very carefully determined to never do something where the mm -hmm. order between them. Well, let me think about how much damage all of these to Han actually are going to Actually, is that here. true? Because I just realized ravaging, um, it could matter what the order yeah, it's is build if, it, all the if it's here. Spiral's presence. So let me see. What is the order of resolving ravaging if it matters? If it makes a difference in what order you resolve the lands for giving action, the players choose. Mm -hmm. So you always choose. That means that um, if there's going to be a cascading bad effect from ravaging because you just completely screwed up, you can at least minimize it by carefully choosing which ones to do the ravaging mm -hmm. in so that it's less bad. Yay. Um, so you always choose the order, even if it's something the bad guys are doing. All right. So we've done a lot this turn. Um, some of it is a little more subtle than others. Linda's push there pro is preventing um, this one from being an actual danger mm -hmm. since those settlers yeah. will only do one damage. And I was thinking about how much uh, how much damage is going to happen in this attack after in this attack that eventually happens after another settlement comes in, and making sure that the spot's not going to get too overwhelmed. That's right. So um, we have each have. A certain number of cards that have been and discarded. And I spent two energy on this, so you I sure did. put those tokens away. But so I still have one time energy. passes, and then we move on to the second turn. Mm -hmm. So here in the second turn, um, I'm pushing over. The mountains are going to ravage this turn. The mm -hmm. wetlands are going to build. And fortunately for me, one of them is not going to build because I roused the trees mm -hmm. and stones to come to life, turn into sort of treant and earth elemental type things, and kill everybody. Nice. Um, so that's good. Uh, and then we don't know where it's going to explore. So it's a mystery. the Ravage doesn't... Oh, no, it doesn't happen yet. That's yeah. going to happen next turn. Yeah, but... Oh, but you're planning out for this turn. Yeah, yeah. So... It's not going to do anything. This is board. completely defended. Yep. This spot is the problem, and that's why I set up... Last turn, my whole turn was set up to make sure I had enough energy to go over here and play the thing where they skip their turn mm -hmm. over here. So we're safe from this turn's Ravage just from that. Um, but I recommend... Uh, yeah, I, re I recommend doing something else that you find that is fun. I can barely... Tr I actually can trigger my innate power this turn. No, yes. No, I can't because mm -hmm. I have to play Rituals of Destruction if I want to, and Rituals of Destruction is not the one I need to play. Well, I can play up to two cards. And um, I think I'll play these two cards this turn while expanding my presence. Um, so do I want to double expand my presence or do I do want to gain a power and expand my presence in a more distant way? Let's see what the next power I'm going to gain is. So um, I can add fear and remove, uh, remove blight. All right. Yeah, sure. We're, we're going to be getting some blight here, I'm pretty sure. Okay. So I am going to pick my growth, the one that gives me a presence within one space of my other presence and add two energy to go onto this spot. It's the one that I told you guys about before, the jungle that's near this really <laughs> horrible area. 
And that so gives me a whole bunch of presents here. this turn. I feel safer in your sacred or sites. energy, I mean. So I'm going <laughs> to hop that way to start getting over toward the stuff on your side of the board. All right. And oh, go you're, ahead. And you're completely safe there. What Linda is saying about being safe, we talked about the fact that if, if you take one damage or fewer, you're fine. Mm -hmm. If you take two damage to the area, a blight gets added, mm -hmm. a presence from every spirit who's there mm -hmm. gets removed, and Dahan die for every two damage. That yeah. Happens. So, so this presence here is going to get is going to get zapped. That presence is going. To, um, mm -hmm. If we don't do anything, in the land Linda's point to has a city and a settler. That's four damage, mm -hmm. and her presence. If we did nothing, the presence dies. Two of the Dahan die because they are two hit points mm -hmm. each. A, a blight happens, and the two remaining Dahan will counterattack and kill the things that are here. Although, of course, it's going to build before it ravages, so it's actually going to kill three of the Dahan, mm -hmm. and only one will be left to kill one settlement. But Yeah, so we are going to need to deal with that space. We're going to need to do certain. something to it yep, yep. Um, this turn or next turn on the fast phase. Mm -hmm. And that might be I'm um, one of the things for you to look at, because I'm still dealing with this mountainous yes. thing. Well, that's what I... This is this is the spot that I've been paying a lot of attention to. Okay, so <laughs> I have grown towards that horrible mountain over there, and I am going to be playing a Year of Perfect Stillness, a fast power, costing three energy that makes them skip all actions there this turn to not do this Ravage with six guys. Um, and then I will be playing Draw of the Fruitful Earth, which gathers up to two settlers um and gathers up to two dahan uh i think that is my best play at the at the moment let's see you're playing how many powers you said how many powers yeah actually you don't really need energy you're playing this particular build of of vital strength i mean you know another thing i could do now that you mention it is if i wanted to I could. I'm asking because of the card that I have that gives you, uh, that gives people energy based. There's the other player energy based. I actually am playing play. two powers this yes. turn because I built the card play build of Vital yes. Strength. And I only have two energy per turn for the same reason. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So I can also just hold on to that one and then do a melting in this area to get some fear and get rid of the blight and yada, yada, yada. Um, but I'm definitely going to wash away regardless. All right. So I think I'll play those two then. We don't need Boon of Vigor right now. I think that we do not need Boon of Vigor awesome. just yet. All right. I have enough energy for what I want to do. Because oh, I, I picked the growth here? option that gave me two extra energy in addition to my income of two per turn. Let's see what people are saying here. Uh, uh, Stephen Booker says, why don't you set up a game you can play with others like me? Well, um, I think that there's an online version of Spirit Island probably that you can play with others. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I'm going to pay my four for my... I'm casting your perfect stillness and draw the, the fruit for Earth. Draw the fruit for Earth gathers up to two settlers right now, um, and I have to gather them to a spot within one of one of my presents. Right now, that's not actually very useful, but it's slow, so we'll see where they go, mm -hmm. where the settlers go, and then I will gather it away from the spots that are bad. For Everything us. I do is slow. I'm going to be pushing some things around. Hey, I did one thing that was fast. <laughs> I, my thing that was fast is perfect stillness so this area is not going to wrap oh and that says the online version is launching later this month on steam so oh, there for you go. uh youtube uh it is currently april 2020 yeah so it will have launched sometime but long before you've seen this episode that is true um so um you figured out what you're doing yes i have i figured out what i'm doing let's do our fa i've done my fast power which i set a little counter to remind that in this area they're not going to get a turn mm -hmm. and that's it so now it's their turn. Okay, yep. they're going to Ravage. In Linda's area, this one Ravages for one damage. Like we said, that's Nothing not a problem. Happens. This is just, Linda already took care of it. Mm -hmm. Over here, they Ravage for three damage. Good thing that it's my Sacred Site, which defends for three. So nothing bad happens. And this Dahan who's here kills, he does two damage and a counterattack. That's how Dahan are. They're, they're, they're about as strong as a Settler Settlement, but they only act in self-defense unless you do something about it. So that kills this settlement. I get to choose where the damage goes. And as before, we get one fear for killing a settlement. Mm -hmm. um, then over here, they skip their turn because I played Gear of Perfect Stillness. 
Um, so that's the ravage. Now then they build. The build. They're going to build on wetlands. So they're going to put a settlement here. And that place is now here. super scary too. It's not always the best luck when they wind up picking the two starting city places as where they're yes. going to go. But hey, it can happen. And then I get one over here, but not in the spot that I destroyed by making a giant army of ants. Mm -hmm. um, all right. And then let's see where they explore. The sands. So, um, unfortunately, because of the settlement they just built, my sands is vulnerable to being exploring. Otherwise, it actually wasn't next to any settlements. Explore and explore. Um, so, because of the fact that we had that happen, uh, we now know that we're done with phase one. See, these seem pretty simple, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the first phase, they always go to one place. In the second phase, they go to one place, except for they do a special power based on their country, which in the beginner game, they don't have a country, so it's basically Yay. the same. And you add in one option to go to all the coastal lands at mm -hmm. the same time. In the third phase, they go to two types of lands at once. Now, you always remove exactly one card from each phase. That means the one we didn't get was jungle, mm -hmm. and then we'll never get jungle in phase one. Here's the scary thing about phase two, though, is that that next phase two card could be the sands again. Yes. Causing the sense to double down into a horrific disaster. Mm -hmm. We don't know. It might just never go to the jungle. But since we know that jungle is not any more likely or less likely, I had my draw of the fruitful earth. I can take both of these settlers out of the sands where they were going to build for sure and bring them both to this jungle where maybe nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I just made a